Welcome. My name is Rod Siegel. I am the director of the MA program in Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Stockton University. On behalf of the programs at Stockton who partnered with us and with my friend and colleague, Dr. Natalia Lazar, program manager of the Initiative for Ukrainian Jewish Shared History and the Holocaust in Ukraine at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It is an honor and a privilege to host today three Holocaust scholars and educators in Ukraine, Dr. Daria Cherkaska, Dr. Roman Shliachtich, and Dr. Yevhen Zakarchenko. This webinar discussion is aimed to highlight your expertise your experiences, your voices, and your perspectives. It is meant to express solidarity with you, to learn from you, and to think together how our audience can support Ukrainians in their struggle against Russia's aggression and mass violence. It is also an honor and a privilege to organize this event together with you, Natalia, and I now turn it over to you to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Ross. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar and discussion. Uh, first of all, before I start the introduction of our speakers, I would like to extend my gratitude and thanks to the uh, following Stockton programs that supported this initiative and funded um, this event. This event is co-sponsored by the following Stockton programs, Holocaust and Genocide Studies Minor, Jewish Studies Minor, Sarah and Sam Schoffer Holocaust Resource Center, School of General Studies and Graduate Education, School of Arts and Humanities, Historical Studies Program, Master of Arts in American Studies, and Dean and Zoe Papas Interdisciplinary Center for Hellenic Studies. I think what is a common feature from most of these programs is that they study and research Holocaust and genocide. Um, it is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce my colleagues and speakers, and I'm very grateful for them to joining our program. Our first speaker is Daria Cherkaska. Daria is joining us from Kiev. She is a PhD researcher at the Center for Archaeology at the Staffordshire University in the United Kingdom. Before joining this program, she graduated with PhD in archaeology. Um, in Kiev. Daria started her PhD studies in UK in 2018. Her previous research background involves studying the Syria and history of Soviet archaeology. Currently, her research focus deals with the application of forensic archaeological methods and Holocaust study in Ukraine. Daria also has experience working as an archivist and in the field of conservation of archaeological sites in Ukraine and has participated in many international projects in Ukraine and Poland. Her research interests lie within the following disciplines. It's forensic and Holocaust archeology, span it's Jewish and genocide studies, it's conservation of archeological heritage. Our second speaker uh, is Roman Schlachtich. Roman is the Dean of the Law Faculty at the Krivoyevich State University of Economics and Technology. He's a historian and Holocaust, Holocaust historian, I would like to emphasize this. He defended his PhD thesis in 2018 at the National University of Kiev Mohila Academy. And his thesis dealt with the resistance of Ukrainian organization of Ukrainian nationalist Banderites group, Ukrainian insurgent army, and the Soviet authorities in the Western Ukraine in the post-war period, starting from the liberation until late 50s. His research interests lie in studying Ukrainian national movement, Holocaust, local collaboration. Um, he is known for his publication, his particular works of scrutinizing local um, collaboration in Dnipro, Krivoyevich um, areas. And most recently, he held two fellowships in 2018 at Yahad in Unum and 2020, just before the pandemic at um, Yad Vashem. And last but not least, our third speaker is Dr. Yevhen Zaharchenko. Um, Yevhen is a senior lecturer at 
the uh, Department of History of Ukraine, School of History at the Karazin Kharkiv National University of Ukraine. He is also the head of historical training lab laboratory. Um, Yevhen got his MA degree in history in 2012, and after that he continued his graduate studies and obtained PhD degree in 2016 at the Karazin Kharkiv National University, where later he joined the faculty. Yevhen um, is teaching various courses in history of Ukraine, and he is one of the, those university faculty who pioneered and developed the syllabi and courses in Holocaust history. Most recently, he taught a course about Holocaust memory and representation in Ukraine. He also worked on grant-winning projects funded by Konrad Adenauer Foundation, Rosa Luxemburg Fund in the field of memory policy of Ukraine since the Declaration of Independence. In the last three years, he was a member of research team of the International Research Project Practice, Practices of the Self-Representation of Multinational Cities in the Industrial and Post-Industrial Era. He was also awarded, his research was supported by grants of the uh, Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies at the University of Alberta, Edmonton, and he participated in various programs dealing um, uh, with memory policy, politics, and Holocaust history. What unites all of, of our speakers today, that they were also participants of the programs organized by the Mandel Center starting from 2016. It's a special initiative um, at the United States Holocaust Memory, which aimed to create a platform and networking among uh, Ukrainian Holocaust researchers and educators, uh, those people who work at the higher level school um, at the university level and create a special network of these people in Ukraine and outside. Um, I would like again to thank everyone and remind our audience that you can send your questions through Q&A box. And now I'm turning to our presenters and I would like to ask them the questions that I'm sure many of us are struggling today. So what is the current situation? What is happening in Ukraine? What's your experience as Holocaust and genocide scholars? Um, what sense are you making of everything what is happening there? Um, we are hearing a lot uh, about war crimes and um, genocide, and um, that's, that's basically the main message of uh, the major newsletters also here in North um, America. So I would like to hear your opinion, and if you don't mind, we will start from Daria and proceed with Roman and then Johan if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to start my, my, my speech with um, thanks to all organizers, to Stock, uh, Stockton University and especially to Raz and Natalia for this very important um, um, opportunity to share my own experience and talk about situation in Ukraine and for Natalia's presentation of me and my research. And as Natalia um, already told, uh, my area of interest is forensic archaeology and especially uh, investigation of mass graves uh, in Ukraine. Forensic uh, uh, um, uh, based on forensic archaeological approaches. And um, <clears throat> it is so strange when um, your area of interest became not only object, but your reality, because unfortunately, current situation um, arises again a question of war, uh, war crimes in, on the territory of Ukraine. Actually, Throughout the 20th century, uh, the population of Ukraine, uh, polyethnic and of different religious confessions, has suffered a whole series of tragedies. Uh, World War I, um, 
Ukrainian war of independence, anti-Jewish uh, violence, also uh, known as pogroms, many occurrences of great terror with repressions and deportation of entire nations, the Holodomor, uh, uh, the tragedy of World War II, and the Holocaust. And the results of all these events was that Ukraine was dotted with mass graves Despite increasing recent research project and open access to archive, many of these mass graves are still remain unlocated. And current war in Ukraine began not 24th of February of this year, but uh, eight years ago with an annexation, annexation of Ukrainian Crimea and occupation of Ukrainian Donbass. And after liberation of um, some temporary occupied um, cities of Donbass region, Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, appeared the existence of first mass graves of civilian victims of this war. But the full scale of atrocity of the, uh, on the un uncontrolled territories of Ukraine could not be investigated. And the full scale invasion of the Russian troops on the territory of Ukraine on 24th February of this year is associated with, uh, <clears throat> with mass war crimes and the discovery of many mass graves of Ukrainian civilian people after the liberation of Kyiv, Chernigiv, and Sumy region. And we expect to uh, discover much more in other regions. Uh, these burial sites will be evidence of Russian atrocities in the forthcoming trials. Uh, and I'm sure they will be a place for commemoration of uh, our victim of this tragedy. But in addition, Ukrainian society faces with another extraordinary ethical challenges. Uh, I mean, uh, the burials of uh, Russian soldiers. Unfortunately, many, many cadavers of Russian soldiers remain left on the battlefields and they are unclaimed by Russian author uh, authorities and still unburied or buried without identification in mass graves. This practice is chained with an attitude of the Soviet government towards the Red Army soldiers during World War II. Thousand graves of the Red Army soldiers remain unlocated in European soil, especially in Ukraine, which was an area, uh, arena, for, uh, arena for the most bloody battles. And it is important to keep in mind that all deaths should be buried and their relatives receive information about them. However, uh, it doesn't mean that um, Russian crimes will be forgotten. It's just about humanity. And um, I think our um, Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dmitro Kuleba, uh, yesterday uh, wrote very power and important message on his Twitter that scholars around the world should start researching um, current war crimes in Ukraine. It seems 77 years since the last big war in Europe is a too long period for humanity. And the Ukrainian tragedy, it's a very loud reminder of worldwide wide, uh, never again motto, but not Russian, we can repeat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dara. Thank you so much for reminding all of us in the audience and also scholars that Ukraine has been a territory where uh, a long history of mass tragedies and mass violence took, took place in the 20th century. And of course, we shouldn't forget about the pogroms of the Civil War, of, uh, the First World War and the Second World War and Holocaust. And before the Russian-Ukrainian War, of course, our priority was to locate the mass graves or um, think how to, the best way to uh, save and preserve already existing mass graves. So that was our challenge. And Russian um, aggression today is actually bringing, it complicates actually um, the, 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 the situation. Now we have to think, well, 
now we, I'm saying we because I'm also a citizen of Ukraine, so not, uh, I'm not here representing the use of uh, USHMM, but the point is that what to do with uh, bodies, um, that's going to be the question that uh, hopefully after the victory, the Ukrainian society and uh, European society will, will, will struggle. So thank you for pointing um, these two aspects. Um, I would like to turn to um, our second uh, uh, speaker, Roman Schlachtich. Uh, as I said, Roman, he's an expert um, uh, on Holocaust history and he was dealing with uh, various uh, issues of local collaboration. And uh, Roman, we would like to hear your uh, opinion and your feedback on the ongoing situation. Thank you. Yes, thank you uh, very much. Thank you to uh, the uh, organizers, uh, Natalia and uh, Russ, for the opportunity to express their views on the uh, current situation in Ukraine. Um, I am from Kriverich. Uh, it is a large industrial city in the uh, southeast in Ukraine, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, we are on the border with the almost uh, occupied Kherson region. Uh, we have not had such uh, Russian rockets uh, attacks as uh, in Kyiv or Mariupol and Kharkiv. Um, uh, however, um, since March, the uh, southern uh, Alps uh, skets of the city is in the zone of uh, defeat of Russian troops. Uh, sometimes I see flashes uh, of uh, these uh, shots from the windows of my apartment. Um, I have been uh, researching the Holo uh, Holocaust in Ukraine for uh, almost 10 years. Um, I am researching the uh, participation of local police in uh, various uh, stages of the uh, Holocaust, as uh, said uh, Natalia. Uh, and so uh, what is happening now, uh, when modern uh, racists are uh, capture Ukrainian cities and uh, village uh, is very uh, remin uh, reminiscent uh, of the events of World War II. I never thought uh, that while researching uh, World, War World War II, I would find myself in a similar situation. Mm, however, mm, uh, something needs to be explained. Uh, the term racists uh, in uh, uh, relation to the uh, Russian occupation force uh, is used by uh, modern Ukrainian mass media. Uh, I hear this uh, term uh, about uh, speak uh, Ukrainian uh, researcher on uh, Ukrainian leaders. Um, uh, Zelensky, for example, um, uh, the uh, term um, uh, racist is uh, in uh, relation to the uh, Russian. Um, uh, I, 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 uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think this uh, term will uh, enter historical science uh, as part of modern warfare. Uh, in my opinion, uh, racism is uh, a combination of uh, Nazism and uh, Bolshevism. Um, uh, from uh, Nazism, uh, the racism took the uh, propaganda and idea and uh, practice of ethnic killings. Uh, Bolshevism uh, is uh, manifested uh, in the attempt to capture the territory of Ukraine, um, as well as in the uh, methods used uh, to capture our territory. So, uh, propaganda. Modern Russia, uh, Russian propaganda uh, demonizes Ukrainians. Uh, Russian viewers are told uh, that it is the Ukrainian armed uh, forces uh, that are destroyed uh, Mariupol uh, and Kharkiv and other Ukrainian um, city and village. Um, that the Ukrainian were making some uh, biological weapons uh, or uh, that they were supposed to use nuclear weapons um, against Russia. Um, uh, this is theory. In practice, uh, Russian troops uh, in the occupied uh, territory uh, are destroyed uh, everything related to Ukrainian history and culture. Um, 
um, in practical uh, uh, for uh, for example um, the already facts uh, or of uh, burning book uh, on the history of ukrainian um, as well as work of ukrainian uh, rights and poets uh, the destruction of monuments of ukrainian leaders and heroes uh, about uh, burn of book this information uh, of uh, occupation Kherson region um, about uh, destruction of uh, monument uh, we can see um, uh, in uh, Radyanka monument of Taras Shevchenko uh, in two bullets in her head um, uh, Holocaust memorials are also being destroyed. Um, for example, it is uh, Drogetsky Yar in Kharkiv uh, or Babi Yar in Kyiv. Uh, we, we can see rock, uh, Russian rock attacks in this uh, place. Uh, in general, it seems that for the uh, everything connected with Ukrainian uh, showed uh, this area. War crimes. Uh, this is only uh, or th uh, this is only the information um, uh, that is uh, uh, available uh, in open source. Uh, they are terrible. Um, a grave in which uh, 28 uh, civilian uh, were shot was found in the uh, recently uh, liberated Bucha. Uh, during the uh, liberation of Bucha and uh, Irpin, uh, there were corpses of uh, civilians on the streets who were simple shot. Uh, the situation is the uh, uh, same in Borodyank. In total, uh, today hundreds of Ukrainians have been killed, killed uh, in these three small towns. Uh, many people who uh, survived the horror of uh, Mariupol uh, are now coming to our city, uh, Krivirich. Mm, uh, these people say mm, that Russian troops in Mariupol uh, shot uh, and uh, are shooting um, for a Ukrainian phrase, a Ukrainian flag, uh, or a tattoo of Ukrainian um, content. It is difficult to uh, imagine, uh, imagine uh, how many victims will be found in this uh, city. Um, by February 2022, almost uh, half a million people uh, lived, lived uh, there. Uh, this is already uh, a lot of uh, evidence of criminals. Uh, we must uh, realize uh, that these crimes uh, were not uh, committed by criminals, uh, but were committed, uh, committed by Russian soldiers and officers. Uh, so such ordinary Russian men. Uh, moreover, in Bucha, uh, murders, raps, uh, raps, and other crimes were mostly uh, committed by young people um, uh, between the age of 20 and 25. Uh, this is still a superficial general portrait of modern Russian murders. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Ramon. I thank you for uh, reminding us again that um, the civilian victims are uh, also targeted in this war. It's not as the Russian propaganda uh, says that uh, they are fighting and they are targeting all the military aims. Um, thank you so much for pointing about the destructions of the cultural objects uh, and monuments. Uh, that's one of the criteria of um, genocide when, when we're talking. Um, and I think what is really remarkable is when you can see the war from your window. For most of us, we, we get all this information from the news today, from the Twitter tweets, right? Posts from Facebook of our colleagues. But seeing it is from the window or being in the epicenter, it brings us to another level. And here, I would like to turn to our third presenter, Johan Zaharchenko, who is joining us from Kharkiv, a city that was heavily attacked in the last 47 days, 48 today days. Johan, please Hello. Hello, dear all. 
Um, can you hear me? Uh, okay. Uh, I greet all of you and I want to thank the organizers and uh, all of those present for the opportunity to participate in this event. Uh, discussing this issue in the American audience is extremely important and valuable now. I am a historian and a lecturer at Karazin University in Kharkiv, and currently I am at Kharkiv. The current situation in Ukraine is extremely difficult. It's not just about the situation or the conflict, it's about the war. This is the largest war on the European continent since the Second World War in terms of the area of hostilities and the number of troops involved. This war is not just the war of millions of civilian lives. This is a war not only for territory and resources. This is a war for our history, our culture, our identity. This is a war for values. And here I must emphasize that the truth is not only about Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian past, Ukrainian identity and values. This is a board, an attempt to reconcile the world order the European past, European culture. This is a protest against the values of freedom, democracy and humanity. These wars is a paramount importance to the modern world. In fact, we are witnessing the final collapse of the Yalta Potsdam system of international relations in Europe. And worst of all, we witnessed the slogan never again stop working. We can see a certain paradox of history. Russia is a secuser to the USSR and a country that participated in the anti-Hitler coalition. But as current events in Ukraine show the lesson of the Second World War turned out to be completely unlearned. One of Russian arguments for launching its offensive was a call to protect the Russian-speaking population. I'm from Kharkiv and I can testify that the majority of the population of Eastern Ukraine really use the Russian language in everyday life and is either Russian-speaking or bilingual. However, as it turned out, this does not mean that they do not have a Ukrainian identity. Some have been talking about the phenomenon of Russian-speaking Ukrainians since uh, 2014. And now the Ukrainian military are holding the defense of Mariupol, Izum, and Kharkiv. There are battles in eastern Ukraine and both in the armed force of Ukraine. And the territorial defense have a huge number of, uh, of Russian-speaking citizens of Ukraine. All the occasions, arguments of the Russian leadership about the protection, liberation of Ukraines and even more Russian speaker people from the fascists and Bandera are absolutely untrue. They want to size and destroy Ukraine because the very facts of its existence 
contradicts the model of Russian peace. The attempt by Ukrainians to build their own state over the past 30 years has been a trigger for Russia's imperial ambitions. And right now, the housing of the civilian population, the urban uh, infrastructure of the cities of the east and south of U Ukraine is being subject to massive bombing and shelling regions uh, where she share of uh, Russian speaking residents is higher um, suffering most. All this indicates the cynicism of the aggressor. Um, Prosecutor General Officer of Ukraine has created a website that collects information on war crimes. So um, maybe I can share the link. Um, Uh, so on this website, we can see that Prosecutor General Office, Office of Ukraine has created a website that collects, that collects information on war crimes and uh, some point, facts of injury, injury uh, facts of physical violence, uh, violence against medical staff, Daniel of... Uh, deprivation of access uh, to medical care, violence against the clergy, damage or destruction of religion buildings, uh, location and use of military equipment uh, in residential areas of the city, uh, damage uh, to, the, uh, to civil infrastructure. Civil infrastructure facilities are most affected. Before the war, I uh, taught at Karazin University, which was founded in uh, 1804 by the decree of Imperial Russian Imperial Alexander I. The building of my university, which are certainly not military objects, have been significantly damaged. damaged. Uh, namely, the building of the School of Economic. Mm, one minute, please. Mm -hmm. Civil and structural facilities are most affected. Before the war, I taught at Karanzin University, which was founded um, in 1804. Um, and I want to talk about this. Um, the building of my university, which are certainly not military objects, have been significantly damaged. Uh, namely, the building of the School of Economics and the Karazian School of Business, the building of the School of Physics and Technology, together with the Katihat um, district, the Karazian sport complex was destroyed. So you can use this photo or see this photo. Uh, one of the largest 
in Ukraine, a separate residential area, Saltivka, is uh, suffering from constant shelling. Schools and hospitals are hit. A bomb was dropped and the building of the drama theater in Mariupol and the maternity hospital in Mariupol was hit by a rocket. The fact of looking and physical violence against civilians have been established in the occupied settlements. Civilians have limited access to medical and humanitarian assistance. There are not all the facts uh, of war crimes. There is a huge number of them. And now the Ukrainian government is working with citizens to Collect evidence of this fact. Thank you. Thank you, Yvan. Um, thank you uh, for showing this uh, heartbreaking images. Um, I'll just uh, I find uh, the courage of uh, university students and university faculty in Karazin is very admiring and inspiring. I just learned that uh, you guys are continuing teaching remotely in spite of this major damages in, in, in the institution and in the city. Um, thank you also for pointing out to um, what is war is and what is what is actually what this war is not about. It's not the war. Uh, of liberation and protections, actually, um, and aggression. Um, I would like to remind our audience that you can post your questions in Q&A um, box, and that will also help us uh, to uh, raise them and discuss them in Q&A session. And now I would like to turn to uh, again to Russ. Thank you. Thank you uh, uh, so much for this, uh, for your first round of uh, uh, um, uh, accounts on what's going on in Ukraine today on the Russia's war of aggression and mass violence, um, on how your fields of research uh, and professional work, uh, and how you're seeing it unfold in front of your eyes in a terrible uh, way. I appreciate very much your, your perspectives also on the levels of destruction, on the assault on culture, on education uh, that we're seeing uh, right now. I'd like you, if you can, for our second round of questions, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for, for discussion uh, with questions for the audience. But for the second round of questions, I'd like you, uh, if possible, to talk about approximately 10 million displaced people. Uh, both internally displaced and refugees who have fled from Ukraine. What is the situation of the internally displaced people? How do you envision the return of refugees and internally displaced people to various places? Uh, maybe we can start uh, with you, Daria, please. Um, thank you for your question, Russ. Um, um, it seems I'm not the best person for uh, describing your situation about re refugees because <clears throat> I stay at my home actually uh, home actually I I'm in the other side of refugees because I'm doing my PhD in the United Kingdom and I return at home um, just a week before full-scale invasion. Um, and yeah for me it was very important to stay with my family because many of us have to uh, look after our uh, families and all of us have um, adult um, relatives, grandmother, grandfathers, um, and people who cannot be ev evacuated. Um, and I would like to say that many of uh, my friends decided to stay in Kiev, uh, in our region, um, especially after um, after the liberation of region, um, because it is important to stay at home and feel that we are 
here and show some some solidarity and it is very important to um for for me it is very important to keep myself busy because for example uh first days first most dangerous day um uh, i keep i i kept working on my project keep translation and uh, of some documents keep writing because uh it it um it was my personal way how to deal with panic and change the focus of my attention and now i know that people who return in kiev um do all their best for returning to normal life because it, it's too hard to stay in in permanent um panic permanent shock situation and um <clears throat> i'm I, I would like to say so many thanks to my amazing friend and supervisor caroline sturdy Colts because she was with me all these days and keep keep me optimistic and all uh team of the center of archaeology of staffordshire university because it shows that we are not only colleagues but friends and i feel all this support from them and i'm look forward when uh, we can meet in person again yeah and thank you thank you sorry it's, that's not a, an answer on your question but that's my opinion and my personal experience thank you so much uh, uh Daria. there's there's already i see a question also uh, uh more about uh, your personal experience but we'll get to that in a minute by uh um a roman uh, oh, sorry, please uh, repeat questions, uh, but it's technical problems. I'm not here. You? Uh, I asked about the displaced people, both internally and the refugees who have fled uh, Ukraine. What? Uh, what do you know about their situation, uh, especially uh, uh, especially how do you envision the return of refugees uh, and internally displaced people to uh, to various places? Okay. Um, uh, it, it has uh, situation uh, change uh, change a lot. Uh, we have uh, constrained uh, Syrians. We we have uh, uh, constrained uh, panics and and uh, other uh, feelings. Uh, we can't work uh, pro uh, properly. Uh, we can't uh, educate education and uh, work uh, students or. For us, it's it's a very uh, important situation. You then. Given are people coming back to Kharkiv? Can you tell us a little bit more? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, uh, the war caused a major problem for refugees and internally displaced people. The invasion of Russian troops began in internal and northern Ukraine. These are some of the most uh, densely populated regions. For example, Kiev and Kharkiv are the largest city with over a million people. Uh, the inventions 
and attacked of the first days uh, were large scale. All this raised uh, a huge mass of the population before had to uh, leave their puberty and their homes. This often happened under fire and uh, life threatening conditions. Some people were forced to leave for central and western Ukraine. Some went abroad. The Ukrainian authorities and the population of the regions with no active hostilities have made considerable efforts to accommodate refugees. We should also thank, uh, thank all the countries and people who help with accommodation abroad. In Ukraine, refuge face the problem of lack uh, of document, lack of housing. It is worth nothing that due to the um, influx of migrants, there has been a sharp rise in rental prices. Uh, some landlords have um, tripled their prices an evacuation was organized from the hotspots. Very often, people were forced to ride 10, 12 people in one uh, compartment, aimed to, to seat four people for more than 24 hours. Large extreme crowds of people led to the spread of uh, infection diseases. The family of my colleague uh, who was traveling in such a train was then hospitalized. Um, immigrants face a shortage of um, funds because the economy has already suffered significant losses. People have lost their jobs or businesses and uh, accordingly a source of income. Uh, many businesses were forced to close and uh, newly arrived Ukrainians uh, cannot find a job quickly. In there is also a big problem of language, um, language ignorance for refugees outside Ukraine. Overcome, uh, overcoming normal stress, uh, people find themselves in uh, different linguistic and cultural environments, finding a job and a place to Leave is also difficult, as most people obviously do not speak the language. Regarding the return of displaced people and refugees, um, admittedly, some of those who left with not return to Ukraine. People have lost everything because of the war and they have nowhere to come back. And it's obvious that those who manage to incorporate into the structure of other states will stay there or at least will try to. Similar as some internally displaced person will remain in Western and Central Ukraine for the same reasons. Most, in my opinion, will return. There is a great um, patriotic absurdity and uh, a certain um, uh, cohesion in Ukraine society now. We can say that Russia is trying to destroy Ukraine and Ukrainians, but under the influence of this external factor, the opposite effect is being formed. Ukrainian society 
uh, unite around the idea of joint struggle, protection of their homeland, and dreams of a speedy restoration and reconstruction after the victory. Uh, sorry, can I, uh, I give more information about my uh, speech? Please, uh, Sorry. Um, uh, I want uh, to tell the example of, of, of my family. Uh, from the uh, first days of uh, uh, Russia's uh, massive aggression, uh, we were at uh, home in Krivirich. Uh, however, from the beginning of March, uh, the family, wife and two children, uh, were forced to leave for Western Ukraine. Um, there they settled in a small room for which you have to pay every day. Uh, there were no normal condition and it was very difficult uh, in terms of life. Uh, although uh, the locals were very, very friendly was very friendly. It was also not possible to go abroad because uh, there was a problem uh, with, with housing. Um, at the end of March, volunteers in Poland of Czech Republic called uh, no longer offers, uh, offer decent housing. Uh, so they decided to return uh, to Krivirich. In, uh, in now, uh, my family stay in uh, our city. Uh, they are already many such examples, uh, people who uh, have been forced to go abroad uh, or move to uh, other cities in uh, Western Ukraine are uh, uh, gradually returning uh, home. Uh, although um, it is not com com completely safe now, uh, after after all, uh, the uh, racists are preparing an uh, offensive in the east uh, and south of Ukraine. Uh, evacuation of women and children was introduced in some cities of Donetsk and, and, and Lugansk uh, region. Um, uh, we all saw what happened uh, at the train station in uh, Kramatorsk. Uh, on Friday, the uh, racist rockets attacked, killing and uh, wounding many people. But people continued to, to leave this, uh, these areas. Uh, some people who had their own business began to transport it uh, away from the uh, fighting. Uh, Those uh, in uh, ivano frankivsk Lviv, Volyn, and other Western region, many shops, cafes, and other uh, moved from the east of Ukraine. Uh, this is one of the options for adaptation, but many people who have lost their homes are forced to integrate into life uh, in uh, other town and village. Uh, it is very difficult, but uh, they all have a dream that after the war, uh, their homes will be restored and uh, they will return to them. Thank you. Thank you so much for your your personal accounts and your uh, perspectives. Um, we have uh, a number of uh, questions, uh, uh, and they all, I think, mix uh, the, the personal and, and some also scholarly uh, dimension. So I, I'd like to, to start uh, um, with uh, Dr. Ramya Vijaya's question, uh, Dr. Ramya Vijaya at Stockton. Um, she writes, thank you for your powerful testimonies. How do you view the response uh, from Europe uh, to the war following on, on your personal account now, uh, Roman particularly, and how does the response compare to the rhetoric of never again that uh, some of you uh, mentioned as well? So if you can talk a bit about how you see the response uh, from Europe or how you'd like to see the response from Europe moving forward. Um, Daria? Thank you for this question. Um, <clears throat> um, it's, um, I, 
it seems it's two questions about <laughs> never again agenda and about Europe response and it's different diff different perspective of European response. I think um, you, Europe made um, a huge a huge uh, um, opportunities for Ukrainian scholars for deal with this difficult situation and uh, it's it seems um, uh, I, I want to uh, sound correctly, but it's a um, huge step to Ukrainian um, scholars integration in European uh, academic uh, academia network because um, Ukrainian scholars received so much um, uh, opportunities to continue their research in the best uh, European institution and universities. Um, if you ask about um, political or military response of Europe, um, I'm sorry, I'm not the best person for uh, analysis of all these um, negotiations and we don't know so much. That's why I don't want to be a person who just say something wrong or what we don't know that's why I, I i would like to speak about what i know and yeah i think the response of Ukra uh, european academic society is amazing and in from my personal point of view i feel so much support from my um um united kingdom university because um they understand my situation they post my um my uh PhD studies, and uh, especially I, I would like to say again, uh, personally, my colleagues and my supervisor, uh, because it's it's uh, not about uh, government response or state response or something like that. Um, this war show um, individual perspectives, and I met uh, the best, the best examples of humanity in in my personal experience um, about uh, never again. Um, I um, especially first days of this full scale aggression against Ukraine uh, against Ukraine. I felt so um, um, so pessimistic and depressed because you know if you if you dedicate your academic life to uh, investigation and prevention of genocide and mass violence and faced with um, so huge uh, example of mass violence uh, unprovoked uh, unprovoked uh, aggression against your people um, for me, it was so um, so depressed and stressful because um, it says hmm, you have done something wrong. Uh, your work uh, didn't work. And sorry, <laughs> sorry for um, for that. But um, now um, it's another. Sorry for this word, but some another inspiration, some another push for me to continue my work. And I understand that it is very important to um, investigate and research previous experience for preventing future uh, crimes. Um, and I would like to avoid a term of genocide for now because it is very... Um, legal legal term and we can use it af only after um juridical procedure but i i'm sure that that would be another example of genocide in europe that's why unfortunately we faced with another another thorough example on ukrainian soil yeah. Thank you, Daria. That's actually a very excellent comment because uh, while um, 
major media uh, bring this uh, word up to discussion. And also we hear in Ukraine um, that, th that this war is a genocide against Ukrainian people. And there the evidence, of course, that testifies about genocidal violence, right? It, it's a little bit too early to talk about that when the war is still going on and um, evidence is being collected and evidence is being investigated as you can pointed out uh, to the warcrimes.gov.ua site and official Ukrainian government. There are several uh, NGO organizations uh, already in various areas uh, in the country that are dealing, um, uh, well, test interviewing survivors, uh, interviewing uh, witnesses. Uh, so that's going to be a long uh, process of collection uh, data and um, investigation, a sort of investigation. So if I'm not mistaken, I saw somebody's hand. Um, if you guys want to jump in, please do. Roman. Yes. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, for my opinion, uh, Europe is uh, responding very slowly. Uh, but uh, the weapons they give use help a lot. Uh, about uh, never again, I, I think uh, it's, it's not work again. Uh, need a new uh, slogan and uh, new terms. Uh, for example, uh, I think uh, in this modern world will be described uh, in new terms. Um, uh, for example, terms genocide. Uh, genocide in uh, Lemke's uh, interpretation is not uh, appropriate to uh, describe Russian crimes. Uh, all they, uh, they have things of uh, genocide. Uh, genocide. Um, I think uh, I think there should be another term, but uh, only after legal qualification. Thank you. Thank you. Um, court first. Um, Thank you so much. We've received very interesting uh, questions and I would like now to turn to them. Um, they all have a personal component and somewhat professional. Um, and I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask a question that Thomas Ubelhor posted. Is there anger, anger towards Russia as a whole? or is the anger separated between those involved and those who are? What is the feeling towards Russian citizens, not just the Russian government, I assume in Ukraine? Anybody wants to answer this question? Yes, my, my, I can. Uh, I blame uh, all Russians. It is a, a Russian uh, military who uh, commits these crimes and uh, the civilians who support them. But it's uh, all uh, questions. I, I, I don't un, 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 understand this, this uh, questions, but uh, Russian uh, people uh, go in my uh, land, Ukrainian land for uh, troops, Russian troops and uh, crimes, uh, this um, uh, killed people, rape and, and other uh, crimes uh, and Thank you. Thank you, Roman. Uh, I think uh, you answered for most of us, Daria. Yeah, I would like to add a bit of my uh, my personal point of view. Uh, it's uh, it's really hard question. It, it's a question uh, which I asked myself since the beginning of the war because um, I, I have Russian roots in my family. Uh, uh, I studied in Russian school. My, my best friend 
from from Kiev. She is Russian. She has a Russian passport, but she struggle with uh, air bombing too. Uh, I blame uh, Russian policy. I blame blame people who support this policy. Uh, I blame. Um, I definitely blame um, Russian approach, uh, imperial approach to Ukrainian history, yes. But um, uh, as I, I would like to hide here under my uh, professional uh, qualification, I would like to wait for um, trials. I would like I would like that all criminals uh, will um, charge with their crimes. I, I think we we need for um, deputization of Russia, definitely we need it. And um, I would like to spend all my um, energy and all my inspiration on um, research of Ukrainian history. Um, and, um, you know, maybe it's my emotional um, part, but I would like to um, spend all my energy on love to my country and my culture, because hate is too um, too difficult uh, emotion, and it, that's not what I want to um, feel all my life. Uh, I would like to spend on something beautiful, and I'm sure this is Ukraine and Ukrainian history. That's why uh, I keep working. I dedicate all my research to Ukraine. I'm so proud of our army. I'm so proud of Ukrainian people. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm, wait, I'm really waiting for trials against Russian and uh, uh, their crimes. Thank you. Thank you, Daria. Michael is asking, it must be especially upsetting to you all personally to be directly affected by aspects of the current war that are reminiscent of the Second World War, not to mention the Holodomor, which you all study as historians. Can you share how this has affected you personally, but also how it may be influencing your understanding of the past that you study? That's what Roman was telling earlier, that he couldn't believe. Roman? Uh, yes, it's, it's, it's hard questions too. Um, but um, in fact, uh, this aggression uh, has for uh, many years brought uh, aggression between Ukrainians and Russians. Uh, I can't uh, imagine uh, that tomorrow or uh, I or my peers in Ukraine will forget Bucha and Kharkiv. And, and this uh, aggression, uh, for my opinion, um, uh, in, uh, uh, enter in a book for uh, Ukrainian history, what uh, modern uh, Russian-Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian war. Thank you, Ramon. I think the first response I was hearing also from some of my colleagues that I was checking on it was um, those who were still actually in Ukraine. It was uh, first that um, it's uh, very difficult to believe what you see, what you hear, especially the first days, but then you actually believe um, by the um, 40 something days of the, of the aggression and you just accept that that, that violence. And uh, Understanding what was happening in any uh, war, or, um, any uh, conflict, a genocide, now it takes a completely different dimension, personal one, uh, the, the suffering uh, of, of the victims. And um, um, we have a next question from Bradley, and um, he's curious how your daily lives and routine has changed as a result of the war. Well, guys, what can you say? 
Mine, I'll tell you, I'm waking up in the middle of the night, sometimes twice, just to check the news from Ukrainian, just to see where the sirens were going tonight, so I can check on you guys. I think um, air air raid al alerts um, are affects everyone in Ukraine because, um, especially first first days um, now um, now it is some some part of your everyday life. Uh, yeah, yeah, and one of friend of mine uh, he tried to <laughs> hear. Um, alarms and uh, check how, let's say, dangerous is it. Uh, for example, maybe here, here, uh, some um, aircraft sound uh, somewhere. Uh, I mean, in some in some regions, you 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 hear um, air uh, air raids alarm permanently, and it's. Really, really hard to spend all your time uh, in shelter, especially if nothing happened. I, I'm sorry, I, I tried to say how it is because I'm, uh, unfortunately, for example, in Kharkiv or in Mariupol, you, you can't ignore these alerts. But for example, um, in Kiev, especially after liberation of north part of region, um, many of people ignore these alerts and just um, annoying with some sirens from your phone. Um, first day, it was real challenge to get some uh, food uh, in my region because, you know, people, people always panic and uh, uh, roads were blocked. Uh, and that's why, yeah, it was it was in uh, it was challenged. It, it is still. Um, uh, com I'm I'm sorry. Uh, I always feel a lot of shame. Compare my life with Mariupol or Kharkiv or uh, south of Ukraine because I I feel that that's nothing compared to to people's lives there, and. This is another another part of your routine because you can't uh, ignore all what happened around you. Um, yeah, but if you ask what happened in uh, in my personal uh, daily uh, daily routine, for example, I can um, go to the forest because it is dangerous. It's forbidden because. Um, our uh, suppers deactivated mine and um, shells um, and bombs there. Um, uh, we still have um, curfew uh, for night time. We have to hide lights uh, in our houses. Yeah, it's, it's minor, uh, minor stuff, but if you uh, compare with your life before war, it changed so much because, you know, it's so complicated to change your behavior. I think it's comparable for many, may, maybe it's bad as association, but it is, it could be compare, compared with um, pandemic experience. You stay at home, that's fine for one week. But if you live in this condition for months or two, it's changed your routine and changed your mental um, health. Again, well, that's I, I just explain um, what feel people in, let's say, safe part of Ukraine. But it's completely different for people near front line. Yeah. You can hear the air raid uh, sirens all across uh, Ukraine, but um, and that's the practice because uh, the government, um, the authorities, they don't know where the rockets will hit. Um, but that's a good point, Daria. Maybe Yvhen or Roman wants to add. So I need uh, help with 
Can yeah, I will. Here? Just uh, speak Ukrainian and I'll translate. В Харкові повсякденні практики змінилися повністю. In Kharkiv, our daily routine has changed dramatically. В другий день після початку війни ми простояли три години в черзі в магазин для того, щоб зняти готівку і купити мінімальний набір продуктів. On the second day of the war, um, together with my family, we, we spent three hours just waiting in the lie to withdraw some cash and buy basic necessities, um, food uh, at the store. Це дуже нетипово для Харкова і взагалі для великих міст України, тому що практика споживання, вона була дуже розвинена до цього. And this, of course, was a dramatic change because before the start of the, the war, the consume, consumer uh, culture was very developed and different. Дуже важливим пунктом цій війні, який буде викликати дискусії і вже викликає, є певна територіальна як сказати, близькість між Харковом, Сходом України і Росією. Um, important points here that already draw some attention and will be still discussed and mentioned in the future is that um, Kharkiv is, um, and Kharkiv region is, uh, territorially speaking, is very close to the border uh, with Russia. Ця проблема полягає в тому, що е, харків'яни, які розмовляють російською, геть не розуміють тонку російську душу. This problem, this problem, this challenge lies in, in the next reality that um, харків'янс, uh, харків uh, inhabitants especially those who are Russian speakers, they do not understand the Russian, the, the, so com- the so-called myth of Russian soul. Тому Харків і схід України так само з усією Україною отримав і відчув цю несправедливу атаку. Kharkiv, together with the rest of the eastern parts of Ukraine, uh, has suffered from this unjust um, aggression and violence. Дуже складно для людей старшого віку, для людей, які мали досвід пізнього Радянського Союзу, чи перших років після розпаду Союзу, зрозуміти, адаптуватися до того, що Росія напала. І це уже є певним таким переверненням, да, струсом усієї системи координат. It's very difficult, especially for a generation, older generation, so those who uh, were socialized and grew up in the late decades of the Soviet Union and witnessed a difficult economic period of uh, the early 90s after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It's particularly shocking to them to accept the fact that uh, um, Russia uh, has attacked them. Звичайні прості обивателі ніколи чи дуже довго чи сильно не могли повірити у те, що могло статися. Але те, що сталося, тепер є точкою неповернення. Before the, this uh, aggression, before February 24, ordinary people couldn't even believe or just accept the thought that um, this type of violence and war is possible. But today, um, 
um, but today it's important to understand that this um, this aggression has become uh, a point of no return. Thank you, Yopan. Um, Russ, would you like to take over? Yeah, I, I, I uh, thank you so much. I I have a question, Roman. I'm uh, I'm very interested in your your comment. Uh, about the need for new terms, uh, about thinking beyond or in different ways about never again, or maybe even about the concept of genocide. And I'd like to tie it to Doug Kirby's question that he asks, what would you like us to convey to our students in the US of what all of you are experiencing in their country? And maybe part of it is also getting them to, to think or to, um, uh, you imagine what's going on because they really need to, I think, use their imagination here uh, and also think ahead, maybe in new terms, uh, uh, as you said, uh, but what would you like us to convey and what kind of new terms perhaps do you have in mind? Thank you. Thank you for, for the question. Um, uh, as, uh, to uh, talk, I think the uh, modern war uh, will be described as a new term. Uh, this term, um, he is uh, a, a new uh, situation in in this in this war. Uh, his situation uh, is uh, different. Uh, for example, uh, in Georgia. Uh, and Ukraine and uh, at 2014, uh, Russian troops supported local separatists. Uh, today, now uh, Russian troops are uh, operating openly. And uh, this, is, this is new. Uh, uh, now uh, Russian soldiers are uh, committing war crimes and this can no uh, longer be, uh, be hidden. And um, uh, uh, therefore, uh, the international tribunal has to uh, qualify uh, these war crimes. And uh, new uh, term uh, is, is uh, uh, this, this um, uh, aggressions, it's a very uh, important uh, situation. It's uh, very um, uh, this, this uh, new uh, term. Um, enter to uh, Ukrainian uh, books on the, on the history. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Okay, uh, we are getting a lot of interesting questions and we have only uh, eight minutes left. So if you um, forgive me, I may just combine the several um, together. Natalia, um, please help me. Um, yeah, okay, you can, you would like to, also, to say something. If we to say something, please. Чи впровадження нових термінів. Звісно, що цей термін не досягне рівня геноциду за своєю ну, глибиною. Але um, let me say. тут важливо говорити про урбіцид. So when we talk about the introduction um, of uh, new terms, we have to um, understand that uh, these new terms will not reach the same level or will not be equal to the term um, genocide. And Yvonne suggests that uh, we probably should 
um, talk and discuss uh, um, the new phenomena um, that uh, orbit, right? The distractions of the urban population. Urbicid, це пряме, навмисне, матеріальне знищення територій, міських територій. Orbicid as a direct intentional destruction of uh, urban um, areas. І важливою характеристикою урбіцид Є те, що мета є не лише знищення інфраструктури, але і цих тих складників, які підтримують ідентичність містян. And important factor here uh, is that um, it's not just intentional destruction of infrastructure of the city structure as we know it, but it's um, um, directed at the destructions of the uh, local identities um, of the local urban population. This can lead to the destructions of the local identities. Таким чином до знищення і місцевої національної, і релігійної, і локальної ідентичності. And will lead also to the, to the distractions of the uh, local ethnic and religious identities. So. Активне бомбардування і Маріуполя, і Харкова, і Ізюма, і інших міст Сходу України і півночі України, і атака їхня, це не лише фізичне, як сказати, нанесення фізичне збитків, але і безумовно культурне. Therefore, the um, bombardment and targeting uh, for destruction of the cities in the east and north part of Ukraine, and particularly cities of Mariupol, Kharkiv, Izum, and others, um, directed at the, uh, not just uh, phys their physical destruction, but also cultural destruction. So? Thank you, Johan. Thank you. Um, um, there's one question from Christina. Um, I'm, I, there's also messages of support that I would like to um, uh, draw your attention. Uh, Christina is asking, this might be a naive question, but is there anything you need from us? Like, is there anything the people here today can do to support the people on this panel or um, the people of Ukraine? Um, and there's um, um, another message from uh, Matthew who writes, thank you all for the powerful presentations and your courage. Do you feel that if the international community would have responded earlier and more forcefully to the annexation of Crimea, that this could have deferred further Russian aggression and prevented the tragedies that is happening today? Oh, may I start? Yes. Uh, I think we should start even before Crimea and Donbass. Unfortunately, the same scenario of uh, destruction uh, Russian troops shown in uh, Chechnya and in Syria. And it's not, unfortunately, it's not only Ukrainian uh, trouble that was um, tactic that was a strategy of uh, Russian government in other countries. That's why, yeah, yeah, yeah I, sh I think, I think uh, world, uh, world uh, had to respond earlier, not now. And uh, unfortunately, people start, people around the world start, start doing something only after the full scale, scale invasion in February of this year. And I would like to add something very 
important for in, important um, for myself, for me. I think um, uh, I think we should um, investigate our history deeply because um, especially for me and for many Ukrainian people, um, great turn was after open access of uh, uh, security service archives and open access to ar archival collections. Because when people learn truth about um, history of their own family, about repressions, about Holodomor, about uh, tragedy, tragedy of World War II, about um, extermination of Ukrainian Jews, um, exter uh, genocide against prisoners of war and abandoned uh, remembrance of these victims. People start change their, very slowly, unfortunately, very, very slowly in Ukraine, change their mind about uh, policy of um, Soviet Union and later ideological um, daughter Russian Federation, and now it is it is necessary for for me personally to show other crimes of uh, totalitarian regime in our region uh, and show that is not an uh, accident that that was a strategy of whole state to to demolish nations, not only Ukrainian, but others. Thank you. That's why, uh, thank you for open access to archives. And I think um, all institutions around the world should digitize their um, collection and give give open access to that. And uh, uh, sorry, another another important uh, important notes. Um, it is also very important to digitize uh, archival collection because, for example, uh, destruction of uh, security service archives in Chernigiv and in Kherson showed that uh, some um, sorrow uh, sources could be. Um, um, destroyed every minute and no nobody gets this information unfortunately thank you Daria. thank you thank you daria Amani, do you want to say anything do you want to add anything thank you so much um i will stop here roman sorry uh, yes i i hear last word mm, uh, for my opinion Yes, if if he had stopped uh, the uh, Russian, there maybe not have been a war today. Uh, they understand only power. I I can uh, see this. I no, it's it's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Ramon. Um, the it was an excellent question. I think that we will be probably struggling answering um, that question for the next decade from Mehran Khan, what can be learned from this war? Because there is already lessons that we know, realizations, um, and um, um, as uh, Yevhen and others pointed out, it's, this war is also um, caused a very strong um, rise of uh, identity and uh, uh, cit citizenship um, um, uh, of political uh, uh, identity, I would say, in Ukraine. Um, but this is not uh, the only lessons that uh, we will learn from it. Um, of course, the war is still going on. Um, um, there's still fighting. There's still danger to civilian uh, lives in Ukraine. Um, and. Um, um, before we can talk about the, the war crimes or genocide, the war has to stop and we have to gather the uh, evidence. And um, so the work, there's gonna be plenty of work. I would like to thank you our um, presenters, Daria, Yvhan, Roman, thank you so much for joining us. I would like to thank you, Ross Sigal, um, and uh, for colleagues, uh, to his colleagues at the Stockton University for providing this uh, unique um, opportunity for us to speak, discuss, yes. and thank you. Yes.
just one so final word. I, I, I'd like to, to thank everyone, the audience who joined us, and thank you, Daria Ivan and uh, Roman. Thank you, Natalia, for the for moderating for the collaboration. And you know, I think that you know, I just want to emphasize also what you said, Daria, at the end, the importance of truth. I think also responding to what we can perhaps do here with our students is emphasize truth, emphasize uh, uh, research, uh, the importance of thinking historically about what's going on also in order to think uh, uh, about what to do uh, uh, moving forward, how to think about these new terms, perhaps, uh, uh, um, and really struggle against uh, uh, the repeats of what's going on today. So thank you all very much uh, for your perspectives. Um, and uh, we will uh, keep in touch and we will continue uh, to try and support you in any way that is possible. Thank you. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you very much. And victory for Ukraine.